Okay, so this is the second part of 10.4. This is a really long section because it's just like all the basics of vectors. And so I really wanna make sure that I go through it thoroughly so that you can understand and when stuff starts building upon itself, you know, you've got it down. Okay, so bear with me. I know if we were in a regular class, I mean, you would have, we would be doing it in multiple class periods, right? Um, so here it talks about position vectors. So we already know that these vectors can exist anywhere, right? And remember I said I had the axes there just as my bearings. Well, now what they're saying is that um, you can create what is called a position vector, okay? Um, and the position depends on where these points are in a Cartesian um, plane, okay? And let me see. Yes, they're gonna get down to it, okay. So this is not a position vector. This is, um, it's just a regular vector that's shown here, okay? I'll talk about the position vector in a little bit. So it says an algebraic vector V is represented by, and this is the component form, okay? So it's not parentheses, it's like little, like they look like less than or greater than symbols, but they're those symbols, okay? So anytime you talk about the components of a vectors, you have to use these symbols, not parentheses, not brackets, okay? And those components are real numbers, okay? Or scalars, right? Just regular numbers um, that are called components. If the vector's initial point is the origin of the rectangular system. So if my beginning point is here, and then it goes out in whatever direction at whatever length, that is called the position vector. And says a position vector describes uh, the horizontal movement and the vertical movement directed by the segment line. So if you know that it's starting at zero, 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 then when you have this component form A and B, normally this is like the X coordinate and the Y coordinate. This first component actually tells you the horizontal uh, movement. And then the Y coordinate tells you the vertical movement, right? Because in order for you to graph a point on a graph, you have to go left or right first, which is horizontal. And then you have to go up or down, which is the Y value, which is vertical, okay? So it tells you the horizontal movement and it tells you the vertical movement. Now it says for the first problem, it says find the position vector V, P1 to P2. So I have to go in that direction from P1 to P2. It says P1 is this as at this location, so negative three and one, and P2 is at that location, which is six and three. Notice that there's parentheses around it because they're describing points, not vectors, okay? It says plot the points P1 and P2 with P1 as the initial point and P2 as the terminal point. So I started here and I went and drew an arrow to there. That is V. It says from the initial point to the terminal point, determine the horizontal and vertical movement. Work, the work to determine both movements should be written as a difference of two numbers. So you always wanna take where you end minus where you begin to figure out the movement, okay? So what I did for the um, horizontal movement is I took the X's. So I took this guy's X value minus this guy's X value. So in that case, it was six minus a negative three, which means it moved a total of nine units. And you can verify that on the graph. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. It did move nine units and it's positive nine, which means it moved in the positive direction, okay? Now, if I take the second Y coordinate, a three minus the first y coordinate, which is one, I get two. And so that means I'm going up two units. So I've already gone this movement. And if I go up one, two, <clears throat> that's where we're getting that, that movement there. So I could draw um, this vector V from zero and then go over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
nine, and then up two units and here. So I could draw V here instead of drawing it where it's currently at. I notice that these have the same length and they have the same direction. So those two vectors are equivalent. But when you start it at the origin, this is called the position vector of V, whereas this is just a general vector of V, okay? Um, so when you write the position vector of V, guess what? You write it as in its component form, nine and two, because that is how you're going to move to find the beginning point and the ending point, okay? And it didn't matter where it began because a position vector will always begin at zero. So when you make these movements, you will end in a way that the vector you've just created is equivalent to the original vector V, okay? So V can be written as this between these two points, or it can be written in its component form which has to do with the position vector. So if you see a vector in its component form, it is literally talking about the position vector, okay? There's, it, you cannot describe any other vector using these little, error, these little symbols if it is not a position vector, okay? So it says here, suppose that you have a vector with point one um, and that point may not be at the origin and point two. If you want the vector from point one to point two, you need to write it in its position vector component form. And how do you do that? You take away the in X value with the beginning X value, the end Y value, take away the beginning Y value. And then you'll have the coordinates or the components for the vector V in its position um, location. So further, it tells us that if you do have two vectors and they're both in their position component form, then the only way that they can be equivalent to one another is if the first components are the same and the second components are the same. Because then that means that they're starting at the same spot. They're both starting at the origin, right? And if the horizontal component is the same, that means they're traveling the equal distance left or right. And if the Y or the <clears throat> second components are the same, they're not called X and Y, they're just called first component and second component. If the second component is the same, then you know that their vertical distance is the same. So what happens is, is they both of them started at the origin and both of them ended up in the same location. So that vector is equivalent because they're gonna have the same length and the same magnitude, okay? Now it says another way of representing vectors is by using unit vectors, okay? And normally what they do is they call I the vector that goes, starts at the origin, of course, because this is a position vector, look at the symbols, okay? So it goes, starts from the origin and it goes just one unit to the right and that's it, okay? So then it's just one unit to the right and no units up or down. So I, the vector I, can be represented by this in its component form. Now J, the vector J, has no left or right, um, no horizontal movement, but it does have a vertical movement in positive one um, direction, okay? So J can be defined in its component form as zero, one. So if you have a vector AB, in component form, you can rewrite that as a times one comma zero, because that means that this value won't affect the second component. It will only change the first component. And then b times the vector zero one, because then that means it won't change the first component. It'll only affect the second component. And then if you add those two together, you can add in component form, it's down here, so it's funny they talk about this after they're using it, but if you add those two together, because basically what you end up with is you end up with A times zero plus um, zero times B. And then if I add those together, I end up with 
a plus zero and b plus zero, which is a b, right? So these are equivalent to this. It just says it is equivalent, but I'm showing you how it is equivalent because this can be rewritten as this. This can be rewritten as this if I know the addition um, property. And then this, if I because I know the scalar properties, I could factor out the A and I could factor out the B. And so then I get this and this. Once I have this and this, by definition, this is I and this is the vector J. And so now, instead of writing something in component form, you can also write it in its unit vector form. So there's two forms. You have component form. There's actually three. Component form means the vector equals A and B. You have unit vector form. And remember, this means it has to be the position vector. So it starts at the origin if it's in this manner. And it's the same with this one, A, I, plus B, J. So both of these forms have to do with V starting at the origin, okay? Both of them. The only other form is just the regular point form. And so that's when you know that V goes from point one to point two in that direction. Um, and that is not a position vector. So this one is just out there in somewhere, depending on where P1 and P2 are located. It's just out there, okay? These two representations have to do with the position vector. So you know that in these two representations, that initial point is at the origin of the rectangular system, okay? Now, of course, there are properties with these. So if you do have two vectors, the first vector having a first component of A1, a second component of B1. Um, and again, these can be written in the unit vector form or in the component form. And you have a second vector that has A2 and B2 as their components. Um, then when you add them, you can just add the two um, first components together and add the two second components together. And you can write your final answer in unit vector form, or you can write your answer in component form. Now, personally, I like to use component form because it's less cluttered and it makes more sense for me and I'm visual. So it just, it, it's helpful in that manner. Um, but I noticed that a lot of times they want the answer in the unit vector form. And so what I'll do is I'll do my work in the, the component form, and then I'll just put whatever I get here in front of the I and whatever I get there in front of the J vector, and then I have the answer, okay? And you'll see that as we start going through some problems. But I always go to the component form. It's just easier for me to look at and so that my brain doesn't go into high anxiety and freak out. Um, I just like to work in component form. And so if at all, and whenever possible, I do change things to component form. But I just want you to realize that the rules do apply to either form, and it doesn't matter which form you use, you will still get the correct answer, okay? Same thing for alpha times a vector, you're just gonna multiply both components by alpha, okay? Now, whether you do it in the unit form, unit vector form, or whether you do it in the component form, doesn't matter, it's equivalent. The magnitude of a vector means to take the first component and square it plus the second component and square it and take the square root, right? Remember, it's a triangle and to find the um, length of the other side, they're basically using the Pythagorean theorem. That's essentially what that is, okay? And especially if you're talking about this vector, which is a position vector, you know that it's a right triangle, okay? So if you have you start with your initial point here and you go out some length there and you go up some height there, you end up there. And so if you notice that is a right triangle, okay? And so then whatever this length is A1, this length is B1. And so you're just literally finding the Pythagorean theorem to figure out that length, okay? That only works if you're talking about position vectors. If you're not talking about position vectors, you would have to use the distance formula in order to figure out what that length is in this kind of problem, okay? So you either 
use the distance formula for this problem to figure out the magnitude or the length, or you would have to turn this into a position vector. Um, and we have a way to do that, right? Over here, you could do this and turn it into a position vector and then find the magnitude using the Pythagorean theorem, okay? So just be careful with that one. I think we have an example of that one in a little bit. Um, these are just to illustrate all the different properties. I mean, you could go look at that. I don't really, this, um, I drew it over here, but it's over here, <laughs> but it's okay. So let's go through some examples because this is really gonna be where the most helpful for you in your homework, right? So it took me about 40 minutes in the last video and then about 15 minutes in this video just to get to the good stuff, right? The examples. So it says here, um, add and subtract the two vectors algebraically. So they don't want me to draw the pictures and connect them and see where it ends up. They just want me to draw it. They just want me to do it algebraically. So remember, in order for you to add two vectors, you're basically adding the first components and then adding the second components. And so when I do that, I end up with these numbers as my resultant position vector, okay? Now, if I take um, V minus W, it's the same thing, um, whether I'm adding or subtracting, I'm going to uh, subtract the first components and then subtract the second components. And then what I get is the uh, resultant position vector. Now, here they get a little bit more complicated. So they tell me five times vector one. So I like to put that in vector four in component form. They gave it to me in component form, but sometimes they don't. And so if they don't, I will put it in component form. Remember the I has to go first and then the J has to go second because the I represents the horizontal um, position and the J represents the vertical position, okay? So if I multiply each of the components by five, I end up with this resultant vector. Now here they're doing three times V minus two times W. So if you write that out, it's three times this vector minus two times that vector. So I'm literally just doing the whole operation for each component. So three times the first component minus two times the second component. That's what I've written here. Three times the second component minus two times the second component. And that's what I've written here. And then I just calculated this, right? So this is 36, or no, I'm sorry. This is 18 minus four, which is 14. This is negative six minus 10, which is negative 16. And then for the magnitude of V, that means I'm gonna take each of these components and square them, add them together and take the square root. So then I did 36 plus four, which is 40. It does simplify a little bit, but not. it's not a perfect square, right? So for example five, we have two different vectors. Now, I don't know why they put this in this section because we really are not talking about this just yet. Because now you notice that there's another unit vector in there called K. And that is actually for another section, which we will get into, called the vectors in space. Right now, all the vectors that we've been doing are two-dimensional, right? They're on your X, Y axes. When you get into three components, not only do you have your X axes, right? It's like your X axes and your Y axes, and they're always kind of slanted, it's weird. So we're used to seeing it like this, right? Right, we're used to seeing this like this and this like this. Okay, well, what they've done is they rotated it, okay? And the reason they rotated it, and not only that, is that it's just like completely different than what you're used to. This is the positive side. So coming toward you is, um, so imagine this is a flat, my piece of paper, right? This is the positive axis and then this is the negative X axis. And then imagine this is going in the other direction, like um, I guess to so like your left and your right, that would be the Y, but this is the positive and this is the negative. And then you're gonna have a third dimension, which is up and down. So this would be negative Z, which is below my paper. And then this is positive Z, which is above my paper, okay? So imagine the XY plane, that's what it's called. It's like a sheet of paper like this, okay? And then your Z is like what is above the paper and what is below the paper, okay? So it's a three-dimensional figure now. And when you have I, it means that you're gonna go positive two in the X direction, 
you're gonna go positive three in the y direction and where those connect is about right here, but then you have to go down two units. So from there, you're actually gonna, imagine you're on a piece of paper and you're here, but now you've gotta go down two units. So if I rotate everything, you'll notice that this is the x, y plane, my hand, and I was located here between my thumb and my pointer finger, but now I'm down two units, okay? And so I'm below that x, y plane. So you take this and you move it down two units. Notice that it doesn't look like it's down two units because this is a three-dimensional figure. So it's really weird on how you, how you draw them, okay? Um, but it, this is three dimensions. Now we don't talk about that until we get into um, the vectors in space, okay? And you won't talk about this a whole lot until you get to Cal 3, because in Cal 3, it's like everything becomes 3D, okay? That's where the good stuff starts to happen, but it's also where most of the confusion starts to happen, okay? So it's very important that you understand the relevance of this and why there's three terms instead of just the two terms as before but you can still put them in the component form. It's just now the I has to go first, the J has to go next, and then the K has to go third, okay? We'll talk more about it because right now I'm gonna do some operations, but I haven't defined these operations for three-dimensional space. That doesn't happen until the vector in space section, okay? So I'm not sure why MyLapse Plus puts this in this section, but I did notice that you might see an example or two like this, so I just went ahead and did it. But really the main idea in vectors in space section is that everything that we talked about in the two-dimensional space extends to the three-dimensional space. That is literally in a nutshell what that section vectors in space is gonna be about. It's literally just redefining everything with the third component. That's all that section is. So when I get to that section, you're going to notice it's going to go pretty quick because everything is exactly the same, just with the third component, okay? So multiplication is going to work the same. So I put this in its component form. If I'm multiplying by three, it just multiply each component by three, and I ended up with this. If I'm doing this algebra, I'm doing two times the first vector in component form minus three times the second vector in component form. Then I'm just taking two times this guy minus three times that guy for the first. Two times three minus three times negative four for the second. Two times negative two minus three times five for the third. Do my little algebra here, I get negative five. Do my little algebra here, I get 18. And do my little algebra here and I get negative 19. And that's the resultant vector. If I wanna take the magnitude of a vector in three-dimensional space, the formula is exactly the same. You just add the third component, the square of the third component. So it's two squared plus three squared minus two squared. And then after all of the squaring and the adding, I get square root of 17, which doesn't simplify, okay? Now, we talked about what a unit vector was but we also want to talk about how to create unit vectors that are in a particular direction, okay? So this is um, this theorem here. So if you have a vector V, of course it has its length and it has its direction. And what you want to do is you want to go in the same direction, but you want to turn that vector into a unit vector. So whatever its length is, whether it's shorter than one, you wanna make it one. And if it's bigger than one, you still wanna make it one, okay? So you want to turn a vector into a unit vector. And the way you do that is by using this formula. You basically figure out what the length is of that vector, and then you divide the vector by that length. So that's what creates the length of one, right? Um, and so then the first example that says you have a vector V equals 12I minus 5J, and it says um, find a unit vector that is the same direction as, um, as this vector V. So I went ahead and put U for unit vector equals the vector itself. I just put it in component form divided by the magnitude of that vector. So I squared the 12, squared the negative 5, took the square root, and ended up with 13. Now, this is the same as saying 
1 over 13 times 12 and negative 15. So if I multiply that fraction in, I end up with these two um, components, okay? And it says, how can you confirm that your answer is correct? You could always find the magnitude of this and it should equal one, right? So this is what I found. And if I wanna find the magnitude of you, it should equal one. So let's go see and verify if it does equal one. So the square root of 12, oh man, why does it look like 112? 12 over 13 squared plus, um, is that negative? Yeah, negative 15 over 13 squared. And so then you get um, 144 over 169 plus 15, oops, 15 squared is 225 over 169. So then you get the square root of 144 plus 225. You get 369 over 169. Now this is not right. Hmm. Because I'm getting three times. I should end up with 169 over 169. Oh, I see what my mistake is. Look at my top vector. It's 12 and negative five because of this, right? 12 and negative five repeated. 12 and what in the world happened there, right? It turned into 15 magically for some reason <laughs> and it shouldn't have, it should have been negative five. So then this should have been negative five. So then when I multiplied by one over 13, that should have just been negative five. So then in here, it should be negative five, which means in here, I'm only adding 25 and 144 plus 25 is in fact 169. And then 169 over 169 is one and the square root of one is one. So we did get the correct unit vector. I didn't originally when I was scribbling this stuff down. But after noticing the error, we fixed it, created our unit vector, and verified that it is, in fact, a unit vector. Now, <clears throat> it says, in many applications, vectors are described in terms of magnitude and direction, rather than in terms of components. So if given the magnitude, if, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, I guess, if given magnitude and direction are given, how can a vector be expressed, okay? So it says a ball is thrown with an initial speed of 90 miles per hour. This is the velocity of the ball. Velocity and speed are the same thing. It says when the ball is released, the angle it makes with the horizontal is 30 degrees. This is the direction of the ball. See the graph below. So they created this graph below. So this is the horizontal. It made a 30 degree with the, with the horizontal and its speed is 90 miles per hour, okay? Now, that just means that after like an hour, it has gone 90 miles, right? So this is really the length, which would be 90 miles, okay? Now, what we wanna do is we wanna have the position here, the point because once I know what this point is, because it started at the origin, I would have the vector in its component form, okay? But I can express X, I know a relationship between X, this side, and 30. We know that the cosine, now notice this is a right angle, right? So that's the hypotenuse. This, um, from this angle, this would be the opposite. And from this angle, this would be the adjacent. So cosine of 30 degrees would be the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is X over the 90. Sine of 30 degrees would be the opposite over the hypotenuse, which is Y over 90. Now, if I multiply by 90 on both sides, you figure out that the X coordinate can be found by doing 90 times cosine of 30 degrees and that the y coordinate can be found by doing 90 times sine of 30 degrees. So what that means is that your vector in its position vector can be written as this. Mm. 
okay? Or in the IJK format. Well, if you notice, they both have a 90, so you could factor that 90 out, which is exactly what they did here. This is just in unit vector form, and I'm writing it over here in component form. And then further, you could even multiply that stuff out and figure out what it looks like, okay? So if I were to do 90 cosine of 30 um, degrees, I get this number. And if I were to do 90 times sine of 30 degrees, I would get this number. And so again, the component form would look like this. Okay, this is just in the unit vector form. So they skipped this part entirely, but I just wanted you to know why there was a 90 outside the brackets. And it has to do with the fact that if you just put X and you just put Y in the component form, um, you could factor out that 90. And that's why the 90 is on the outside. But they don't even describe like where this came from because they have it in brackets, but then they don't have it in brackets here, which as a reader means they already distributed the 90 back in, okay? So it says, of the initial speed, how much is in the horizontal direction? And since this is the horizontal um, movement and this is the vertical movement, they're only asking about the horizontal. And if you put that in your calculator, you get this. So it's moving this fast in this direction. And then how about the vertical position? That would be the vertical movement and the vertical movement is obviously traveling 45 miles per hour. Why is it per hour? Because they labeled this miles for 90 miles, I know that it's only gonna have traveled 90 miles in one hour, okay? Because it's going 90 miles per hour. So when they talk about these, if it's everything is happening in one hour, then that measurement is also going to be in miles per hour, okay? And the same for the last one. Now, let's talk about this section. It's the last page and then we'll go into some more examples. Um, I think I'm just gonna finish this video. I don't think I'm gonna stop it and then continue because um, we've been recording for about 32 minutes. I think this is okay. So um, it says, given the magnitude of a vector and an angle, you can write it as the magnitude times cosine of that angle I plus sine of that angle J. Or in component form, it would be the magnitude times the cosine of the angle and then the sine of the angle. Again, I like to work in co component form, so I'll always rewrite all of my definitions in component form so that you can see how it relates, okay? So in the first exam or in this next example, it says a Boeing 737 jumbo jet maintains an airspeed of 550 miles per hour in a southwesterly direction. The velocity of the jet stream is a constant 100 miles per hour from the west. Find the actual speed and direction of the aircraft. Okay. So I know that the jet is going 50. 550 miles per hour in a southwesterly direction. And the velocity of the jet stream is a constant 100 miles per hour west. So it says find the actual speed and direction of the aircraft. Um, when you're asked to find the um, actual speed, what it's asking you for is um, called the resultant vector. And we already know that the resultant vector comes with algebra. And the more specifically, it's from adding those two vectors together, okay? And so the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna find um, either one, it doesn't matter which one you did. It looks like I found the jet stream first because it seemed easier. Um, and then I found the velocity of the aircraft second, okay? Um, but it doesn't matter. So we've got the velocity of the relative to the air, and then we have the velocity um, of the jet stream, okay? So we know that here, notice that if I'm going in this direction, now a normal, um, if I were to put this in polar coordinates, right? This thing here, I would be traveling 180 miles over there, okay? So 
I'm going around 180 miles. So that's supposed to be the cosine of 180 and then the sine of 180 times the um, uh, magnitude, which is the 100 miles per hour. Now, if I do cosine of 180, I get negative one. Sine of 180, I get zero. If I multiply both of these by 100, I get the component form negative 100 comma zero, which in unit vector form is negative 100 I plus zero J, okay? Now the air, because I went southwesternly, like exactly southwestern, that means this is 45 degrees. So if I've already gone 180 and then I need to go another 45 degrees, that's where I got the 225 degree angle that I put here and here. So there's my magnitude. My angle is 225 degrees. Cosine of 225 degrees is this value. Sine of 225 degrees is that value. So then I distribute in my 550 and I got this value and this value. Um, and you could put it in the unit vector form or you could put it in the component form. It doesn't make a difference. It's the same thing, just in a different form, okay? So then now it says, find the velocity G, which is relative to the ground. It wants the resultant vector. And in the book, it talks about the resultant vector being the sum of the other two vectors that you were given, okay? So that means that I need to take the vector with, um, in the air. So that's this one that we just found plus the vector of the jet for the jet stream. And that's this in component form. And so then to add them, I'm doing it the way I need to do it for the component form. And so then I can't really combine these because they're not like terms. So it's just that in front of the I vector. And then this plus zero is just this. So it's that in front of the J vector. And the only reason why I put them in the IJ form is because in the computer, it says it wants everything in terms of I and J. So even though I work in component form, I always make sure that I go back and I put it in its IJ form. Now, C says find the actual speed and direction of the um, 737 relative to the ground. So we know that V sub G is the vector relative to the ground. Now we already know um, its position. So we kind of already know what direction it's going in, but not exactly like as far as like plane and bearings are concerned. So we'll, we'll fix that in just a little bit, okay? So for here, to find the speed, that's the same as the magnitude. So we're gonna take that number squared plus that number squared, each component squared, and then take the square root of the sum. And it said to round it, so I rounded it to 625. Um, so that's the speed, okay? Now, in order for me to find the direction, they want it in um, bearings, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna figure out what that angle is so I can figure out where I'm at with this new vector, okay? Um, it seems like I'm going to be, I don't know, it seems like I'm going to be in the negative direction and then the negative direction, but may not necessarily be true because you're going to be taking the um, division of this. So it might turn into a positive value, but we'll see. So we're going to do tan inverse of y over x, and then we're going to do the y value, which is the j component over the x value, which is the i component. And then when we put that in the calculator, we get 38.5 degrees. And so then in this particular case, I think this is wrong. Let me see what this is in a decimal form. So negative 275 squared, that is not the right thing, delete. 275 square root of 2 minus 100. That is like negative 48.9. And then negative 275 square root of 2 is like negative 38.5. 
388.9. So this doesn't make any sense to me because with those values, when I draw the position vector, it would be a negative horizontal distance and a negative uh, y. So really it's going like this, okay? So this answer is not correct then because that's not going north and then east, right? Or north and then east. So I need to talk about that real quick. Okay, so this is not the final answer there. It just isn't. It doesn't make any sense for it to be because I'm not in the correct quadrant. Okay, so I found out that this angle is going to be 38.5 degrees, but mine has that same angle sort of, but it's over here in this quadrant. So remember, that means I'm going to have to add 180 degrees. So for my alpha, it's actually going to be the 38.5 plus 180, which is actually 218.5 degrees, okay? And so then this is going to be a little bit different. So I'm actually going south and then so many degrees, I see. So I'm going south, but then I'm going so many degrees to the west, and so that is going to be south, but then 38.5 degrees west. Because this distance is going to be the same as that one. Okay. So I do use a 38.5 degrees, but I'm going south and west. So it's not north and east. That one didn't make, it wasn't sitting well with me because that's not the direction that I'm going in. And it makes sense because look at the beginning of the sentence. It says that the thing is going southwesternly, right? So it should be going in that direction. So this is more of the correct bearing than the way it was before. I'm glad I filled all this stuff out and I'm just like kind of going over it because I'm really being able to find my little tiny errors in there that's throwing it off a little bit. Okay. So now it's saying for the last example in this note packet, okay? It says some weight is suspended from a ceiling. The weight is a thousand pounds. There are two ropes holding the item in the air. One of the ropes, should be an S, one of the ropes forms an angle of 45 degrees and the other forms an angle of 30 degrees. Find the tension of the two ropes, okay? So there's actually three things going on here. There's this, there's the force here, the force here, and then the weight coming down, okay? So there's some tension here, some tension there, and then the, the this going downward is creating that tension more, right? So in order for me to figure out what's happening, I do have to use the idea of equilibrium an equilibrium only occurs when all the different tensions and all the different factors add up to equal zero, okay? So before I could even go ahead and try to add everything up to zero, I actually have to figure out what information I have right now. So for F1, this is going to be, um, oh, I drew it down here. It's a little bit better image down here. And let me, let me zoom in, okay. So you can see that a little bit clearer. Now, so what I've done is I've just created this, but I put it on top of an X and Y axis, okay? And so this is my thousand pound weight. This is the first rope, the second rope. And now this vector here, I'm calling it F1. And that's the one that's on the side with the 30 degrees. This vector here, I'm calling F2 with the 45 degree. And then this one is vector three, which is the weight pulling downward, right? So I know that for here, or let's do F2 first, because F2 makes more sense. For F2, the angle respect to the horizontal is just 45 degrees, because between here and here, this is 90 degrees, that's zero degrees. And we already know that this is 45, and this is a right angle. So then that has to be 45, and this being the ceiling, right? So there's a right angle between the axes here and the um, ceiling, which means that both of these would have to be 45. Now, if this is 45, I know that the axes are also 90 degrees. 
So this would have to be 45. So what is the angle that F2 traveled? It traveled a 45 degree angle. So F2 can be defined by the length of that rope times cosine of 45 degrees, sine of 45 degrees. Or if I calculate those two values, the length of F2 times square root of two over two and square root of two over two. I don't know what the length of it is though just yet, okay? Now, if I go over to the other one, remember it said this was 30 degrees, but there's a 90 degree angle between this um, Y axis that I've portrayed it onto and the ceiling. So if that's 30, this is 90, then this has to be 60, right? Because the triangle has to add up to equal 180 degrees. Then I already know that I've gone 45 degrees. If I go another 45 degrees, I'm now at 90. And then if I go another 60, I've done the complete angle to get to F1. And so that complete angle is going to be 150 degrees, right? 90 plus 60 is 150. So this is going to be found by the length of F1 times the cosine of 150 degrees, sine of 150 degrees, which is the length of F1 times the negative square root of three over two um, and one half. Now, F3 is going directly down and notice that this is at a total um, of a 270 degrees. So in how far down is it going? I don't know why I put 1200. This thing is only a thousand pounds. Oh man, I don't know how much that's gonna mess up my paper, but it should be going down a thousand pounds of force. So that should be my magnitude there but two seven, cosine of 270 and sine of 270 is zero and negative one. So that means, where on earth? I must have saw two somewhere. Why did I do that? Okay, anyway, let's keep going. So in order for me to have the equilibrium, all three would have to add up to equal the zero, fact, uh, the zero vector. So that means that if I multiply this in, right, that means the first vector plus the second vector, if I multiply the F2 in, the magnitude of F2, plus the third vector, which would be zero and negative thousand, should equal the zero vector, which is zero, zero, okay? So then what that means is that, I'll do it in colors. What it means is that this term plus this term plus zero should equal zero, right? So this term plus this term plus zero, doesn't change anything, should equal zero. And it also means that this term plus this term plus, or yeah, plus a negative 1000 should also equal zero. So that's where I got this and this, and then plus a negative is a minus equal to zero. So I have two equations here and I need to use these two equations. They basically create a system of equations that now I need to solve for F1, the magnitude of F1 and the magnitude of F2 so that I know what those values are, okay? So, and that's what it's wanting me to find. It's wanting me to find the tension of those two ropes. So it's wanting to know the magnitude of F1 and the magnitude of F2. So what I've done is I took the two equations and I think I multiplied the top one by a negative. So there's my, let me pull this down. I multiplied the top one by a negative one so that this became negative square root of three over, or positive square root of three over two. This one became negative square root of two over two and zero times a negative one is still zero. Then I rewrote the second one underneath but I moved the thousand over to the other side. So this is gonna affect all of my final answers, but it's all right, I'll just recompute. Okay, so then I move the thousand over. So then now I do my elimination method, right? This plus this, whatever in the world that is, times F1. And then these two cancel and zero plus a thousand is a thousand. So if I wanna solve for this uh, magnitude of F1, I have to divide by this on both sides. And so I get this expression and let's see what that is. Cause that's obviously not correct. This is not correct. So I get square root of three over two plus one over two. Uh, so it's 
um, 732.01 pounds, okay? So that's how much weight is coming down on that one rope. Now the other rope, now let's look at the originals again. So this time I multiplied this equation by a square root of three so that I could get square root of three positive in the numerator and then these two could cancel. So when I multiplied this by square root of three, I got this. When I multiplied this by square root of three, I got square root of six in the numerator. And then this moved over to the other side, but I also multiplied it by square root of three as well. And so then over here, these would cancel. This and this is just together with the F2 factored out. This and this is a thousand times the square root of three. And then divide that on both sides. So I get this expression and of course that's wrong. So let's see what we get. So fraction 1000 square root of three over square root of two over two plus square root of six over, oops, nope, that's not what, dang it. <sighs> there we go. So square root of two over two plus square root of six over two. There we go. Now it's looking like what's on my, oh, nope, I'm missing a digit. Not a hundred, right? It's a thousand. There we go. Now that is looking like what I've got on my paper. And I get 896.6. So there's 896.6 pounds of tension on that particular rope, okay? So remember which one's which. Um, F1 is the one on the left down here, and then F2 is the one on the right, okay? So the left rope has F1 has 732.01 pounds of tension, and then the right rope has um, 896.6 pounds of tension. And that's what they were asking you to find. So you definitely had some system of equations going on in there. And I remember when I was in pre-cal, this was literally like the hardest problem out of, of the whole class. So if you can get through this, then you're better off than I was when I was taking pre-cal because this was like the worst problem ever for me. Um, it doesn't seem so bad now, now that I'm looking at it again as an instructor, right? But I remember when I was in school, this one really, really blew my mind, okay? so. Hopefully I've explained it enough so that you can figure it out on your own. And even if the numbers are changed or the scenario is slightly different, you would still be able to figure um, that out. That's my job as an instructor and I hope that I've done it properly to service you the best, okay? Um, this, there's also a couple more problems in this section that I noticed that I haven't gone over in the notes that are given to me by the my Math Labs Plus people, okay? So I went ahead and picked out these extra problems that you need an example for, okay? So I noticed that in one of the problems, it gives you the two vectors, and then it's asking you to find all the values for X for which the magnitude of the sum of the two vectors will equal four. And so the first thing I did was I put them in component form and I tried to find the sum. So this should be two and negative six, and then this should be X and then positive nine. And if I add them together, I get two plus X. I chose to write it as X plus two, and then negative six plus nine, which is three. Then if I find the magnitude of that, I get this guy squared plus that guy squared. And if I wanna know where the magnitude equals four, what I'm asking is where does this square root equal four? So then what I've gone ahead and done is two things. One is that I squared both sides, right? To get rid of the house on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, that's where the 16 came from. I've also simplified what was in the inside. So I took this X plus two times itself and I went ahead and foiled it out and I got X squared plus four X plus four. I combined my like terms and I got 13 and then I got it equal to zero so I could actually solve for X. 
Now this I could not factor um, because the only two factors of three are three and one, and those don't subtract to give me four. So I had no choice but to use the quadratic formula. So I did negative B plus or minus B squared minus four times A times C all over two times A. I simplified it down to this. And then I even simplified each of these by two. So I ended up with this. And so there are really two X values here. Um, it's X equal to negative two plus square root of seven. And then X equal to negative negative two minus square root of seven. Maybe, hopefully, if you have this problem in your homework, it's not as ugly as mine. You might actually be able to factor it and get the two answers that look pretty. Um, but if you can't factor it, you do have an example of what it would look like. It's not nice, not pretty, but it is what it is, right? So that was one problem that I noticed that I have not covered yet, okay? Then the other problem that I noticed was um, they gave me this and they wanted to know what direction angle does the vector have, okay? And so what I like to do is I like to plot it in its position form. So notice that it's gonna be a negative uh, X component or a horizontal component and then a positive J component. So it's gonna be up here somewhere, okay? I don't know the links exactly. I'm really not giving um, a care about that. I just want to, um, know what the angle is. So I want to know what this is, what that angle is, okay? So the first thing that we figured out was that the, and I, I guess I could have done it a little bit different. It looks like I figured out how to do it a long way, um, but I think I could have done it a lot faster. And I'm going to try to do it on my calculator real quick to see if I would have had the same answer doing it this faster way. Oh yeah, I would have gotten the answer a lot faster. I was not, I mean, obviously there's multiple ways to solve this problem, right? So what I did was I found the magnitude of the vector because I know that the vector can be written as the magnitude times cosine of an angle and then sine of that angle. Um, I don't know why I put another angle there. It should be the same angle. So then once I knew what that magnitude was, I knew that 24 times cosine of alpha had to equal this value. And I knew that 24 times sine of alpha had to equal that value in order for the two to be equivalent, right? And so then I divided by 24 and I reduced, I got this, divided by 24, I reduced and I got that. And the only angle that fits this description here on the unit circle is 150 degrees. So this is great because I know the answer should be 150 degrees to pay based on what I did previously, but there's another way to do it and it's a lot faster, okay? The other way to do it is if I put this in its component form, all I have to do to find that angle is do tan inverse of y over x or b over a, whatever letters you're using. So that would mean 10 inverse of 12 over negative 12 square root of three. And if I type that in my calculator, my calculator actually tells me it's negative 30 degrees, okay? Now that's obviously not the same as 150, but we're gonna talk it out, okay? So what my calculator told me is that I got negative 30 degrees. Well, notice where this is located. It's located in the opposite quadrant. How am I gonna get from here to over there? In order for me to do that, I'm gonna to have to add pi units to my angle that I found. So if I take negative 30 and I add the pi units, which is the same as 180 degrees, I get that 150 degree angle that I was supposed to get, okay? This is a lot faster and easier than all of that, but obviously there is two ways to do this particular problem and both of them are correct. So if you're on a test and you spaz out like I did and did it the long way, that's okay. Um, but if you remember you're super genius and you remember the short way, then you can do that too, okay? Now my solutions always go with one way. Um, now that I'm aware that I should have done this, I would probably do that if that happened to be um, a test question, okay? So other than that, we are finally finished. So this video took about an hour. The other one took about 40 minutes. So in 
terms of like a regular classroom, this classroom would probably, um, it has to be three hours per week, right? And we've already covered um, an hour and 40 minutes. So really I still have about um, an hour and 20 more minutes and hopefully I can get through the next sections in that amount of time or just a little bit over. But this is it for this. Actually, I actually only have one more section for this week. So I definitely will be able to cover that one in less than an hour and 20 minutes. It's not gonna take that long. So toodles for this one. See you in the next one.